time you speak out of your mouth, your words have power. I'm going to tell you all the time. I tell the church, I tell myself, Proverbs 18 says that the power of life and death are in the tongue. What comes out of our mouth, it says, and the man who speaks his belly will be satisfied with it. Whatever you speak is going to satisfy your belly. So if you're sick and you keep speaking that sickness, well, embrace it and get ready to get sicker. Get ready to get more sick. You've got to do the opposite. You've got to speak. And, and, and my wife is, is, is awesome for that because she'll always make sure that I don't speak any negativity. Even even when, you know, she'll see it as there's certain times my body hurts. And she'll ask me how I'm feeling. And then, of course, being a good wife, she'll remind me how to answer. <laughs> That's how wives are. They'll ask you a question and they'll tell you how to answer. Amen. And and, and, and I, I listen to some comedians, and I like when I listen to the ones that talk about being married, because they got it, man. They, they, and they said, you know, sometimes, he, he gave an example. He said, you know, when you women talk to us men, remember you're dealing with men. So if you want us to do something, what you need to do is this. Okay, January 19th, 7.30 p.m., we're going out to dinner with this woman, Right? We store that, and we got it. What what does not work for a man is when you come up and go, hey, remember that one from school? And you start giving all these details about this person, and then you finally get to the date. Listen, by the time you got to the date, we're already zoning, thinking about who got drafted in the draft last night, or, or how the Yankees are worth. We're already long gone, amen? the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 21. And like I said, I think, and when you have it, you can all stand. I think that uh, Matthew 15, verse 21, I think we settle for too much as believers. I think we put up with too much mess in that devil. Amen? We put up with just too much. We allow too much. And a lot of it is our way of thinking. And it's our thought processes. And then the other is what comes out of our mouth. What comes out of our mouth should be nothing but what the Word of God says about us. Amen? All right. Well, Matthew 15, verse 21 reads, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is truly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word, and his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall down from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. The word of the Lord, you may be seated. You see, and I'm not calling you dogs, but I think sometimes we live like dogs. And all we do is crawl around eating crumbs off the master's table, leftovers, and stuff that, that you know, just, we're just barely getting by with our, our, quote, relationship with Jesus. And our relationship with Jesus is, well, I go on Sunday and I go on Wednesday because it makes me feel good. And I get my little bit of crumb there. And maybe I get a crumb when he today sends me a scripture. And I get a little crumb here and there. And I think because we just settle for the crumb, that's why we can't get over our sicknesses. That's why we can't get joy back in our life. That's why we're always going from check to check and, 
and bills are getting paid in the order of importance before they're getting shut off. That's how, and those, and those are believers living like that. And as I believe as believers, we're not supposed to be living like that. We're supposed to be sitting at the king's table, eating with the king. Amen? We're not supposed to be just living on crumbs. And I think a lot of us live on crumbs. And a lot of us entertain things and allow things in our lives that should not even enter into our lives. Like as soon as some report of sickness comes into your life, you need to put that right under the script of Dr. Jesus and, 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 and apply the blood of Jesus to it and stop wording it out of your mouth. Every time you speak out of your mouth, your words have power. I'm going to tell you all the time. I tell the church, I tell myself, Proverbs 18 says that the power of life and death are in the tongue. What comes out of our mouth, it says, and the man who speaks his belly will be satisfied with it. Whatever you speak, Speak is going to satisfy your belly. So if you're sick and you keep speaking that sickness, well, embrace it and get ready to get sicker. Get ready to get more sick. You've got to do the opposite. You've got to speak. And and, and my wife is, is, is awesome for that because she'll always make sure that I don't speak any negativity. Even even when, you know, she'll see it as there's certain times my body hurts. And she'll ask me how I'm feeling. And then, of course, being a good wife, she'll remind me how to answer. <laughs> That's how wives are. They'll ask you a question, and they'll tell you how to answer. <laughs> Amen? And, 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 and I, I listen to some comedians, and I like when I listen to the ones that talk about being married, because they got it, man. They, they, and they said, you know, sometimes, he, he gave an example. He said, you know, when you women talk to us men, remember you're dealing with men. So if you want us to do something, what you need to do is this. Okay, January 19th, 7.30 p.m., we're going out to dinner with this woman, right? We store that, and we got it. What, what does not work for a man is when you come up and go, hey, remember that one from school? And you start giving all these details about this person, and then you finally get to the date. Listen, by the time you got to the date, we are already zoning, thinking about who got drafted in the draft last night, or, or how the Yankees are. We're, we're already long gone, amen? So the good wives learn how to get to the point, amen? So like my wife, she'll say, hey, how you feeling today? Remember. Positive words have more power than that. Don't put them negative words in your mouth. Like, oh my God. <laughs> and then, and then if I turn around, from her, she goes, don't roll your eyes in your head. <laughs> she knows they're rolling. She's not even facing her. <laughs> but see, I, I think we put up with too much stuff. I think we're just running around the table eating crumbs. We gotta stop eating crumbs. We gotta say no more crumbs. I'm gonna sit at the table with the king. That's what we're called to. You know, and, and, and a lot of that has to do with with what we get I don't even call it complacency. I think sometimes we compromise. You know, complacency and compromise go hand in hand. Well, you know, I don't have to do any more because I'm fine right where I am. God doesn't want you sitting where you are. God wants you moving forward. God wants you pressing forward and going farther and farther into his presence. God can take anything from you that that devil's put on you. God, God can take sickness from you. God can take poverty from you. God can take mental and any kind of emotional disorders from you. But if you keep running around the table, eating the crumbs of the diagnosis of a man, and barely getting a little bit of crumbs from Jesus... You're going to stay where you are. You're going to stay sick. We're going to stay broke. We're going to stay frustrated. And then we're going to compromise our way out of it and say, well, it's okay. I'm staying. I'm staying. Well, listen. If you're saved and we're living like that, who else will want to get saved if they're living the same way? Oh, well, you're saved. Look at you. I'm saved over here. Why would I want to get saved? Hey, man, if, if being saved living like that, and I'm here and I'm going to hell, well, hell's better than you. Look at my life compared to yours. That's, that's reality. Non-believers who want to find ways why they shouldn't have to believe. Because they don't want to believe. That's why they're non-believers. Well, 
as believers, we're supposed to be dining with the king, introducing people to the king. We're not supposed to be introducing people to Jesus, the king of welfare. Oh, let Jesus give you some food stamps. Let, oh, let, 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 let Jesus just oh, give you a little bit of trickle of goosebumps, but not totally heal you. Man, listen, God can heal you of everything you've got going on. But you can't accept the reports of the world. You gotta say, I'm not gonna, I'm not, no more crumbs. I'm coming out. Say this, that no more crumbs. I'm coming out from under the table. I'm not a dog. I'm a prince in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. I'm coming out. You're coming out may just be coming out of a way of thinking. You're coming out maybe stop looking at the circumstances and looking at the creator. See, because we'll look at circumstances and forget that there's a creator who knows our circumstances and can change whatever he needs to change. But a lot of it comes by with our confession of faith. In the book of Matthew, it says you're either condemned or acquitted by your words. Whatever comes out of your mouth is what's going to either condemn you or acquit you. See, the devil always don't want to make you taste you out of it. Guilty of this. Guilty of that. Oh, he, they're guilty of having diabetes. Yep. I put that devil right there devil with diabetes right off. And then you can say, yep, I got diabetes. And, and then you do got to watch this video, watch this video. But why are you doing that? It's by the blood of Jesus to you every day. By the blood of Jesus. Say, say, the blood of Jesus runs through my veins, and Jesus don't have no diabetes. Whatever it is. Sickness. Whatever sickness you got. Stop claiming using that word. Every time you tell yourself you have that, you're going to continue to own that. You got to say, I do not have such and such. I have Jesus. And I'm healed by Jesus. And when people see you and the transformation that happens to you, that's going to draw others to him. You know, I was so impressed with Elsa and Minister Lopez came up to me a couple weeks ago and go, hey, my two-year anniversary. And I was like, two-year anniversary? Took me a minute. She said, and I got healed and I passed her. She got that seat. You see, she got that date marked. That that that's her 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 little her little nameplate her little her little you know like a cornerstone in her life like you know in a building when you build a new building they they used to put a little cornerstone with the date like if you go to a lot of old schools when they were built there's always a cornerstone and there's a date where that was built but that cornerstone has a besides a documentary purpose it also has the cornerstone is the strongest corner on that property and on that building. So right now, she has a cornerstone of, so, of a date two years ago when she got healed and delivered from cancer and when God reached through cells that they had determined gone by the cancer. Come on, give God praise! She said, she said, you know what? I'm tired of eating crumbs and going to the Moffat Center. I'm going to go to the king's table and I'm going to eat the fresh bread of God's healing and the power of his anointing and I'm going to get healed by that blood. And she did. Because she was not satisfied with man's report. She was not satisfied with saying I got cancer. She was satisfied by saying even the dogs eat the crumbs that are under the table. I'm no dog. I'm coming out. Come on, give God praise. Say no more crumbs. Say no more crumbs. I'm coming out. See, every one of us, look at it, he says, Oh woman, your faith is great, and it shall be done to you as you wish. You see, the disciples said, Lord, let's just get rid of her because she keeps shouting at us. Because you need to shout at those devils in your life. You need to shout at that sickness in your life. You don't have to sit there and go in the morning. You know, I'm not going to go to Jesus. The sickness is inside the bed. You can't know that we'll be the same thing again tomorrow. No. No. Be like, 
I apply the blood of Jesus to my life. I apply the blood of Jesus to my whole body from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. No infirmity, no unclean spirit, no sickness can dwell within me because God lives in me and I am, and His blood saturates me. Sickness, you get out today in the name of Jesus. Doctor's reports, take their report and report the opposite. Report the opposite in a doctor's report. And watch it come to pass. It says, by your faith. See, she knew. The principle here, she was like, listen. Even if, okay. It's no sense me taking the chosen bread and giving it to the dogs. But even the dogs eat the crumbs. She knew that she was even entitled to just some crumbs. But now. Since G, and she's a Gentile. She wasn't one of the, that's why he said, you're not one of the chosen house of Israel. But since Jesus got born, got died and rose again, and we become born again, we are not even dogs, supposed to be dogs under the table. Bible in Galatians says we have been grafted in. We have been grafted in to the body of Christ by the crucifixion and the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are entitled to the whole smorgasbord on the king's table. To, to the king crab and the filet mignon of his word. To what his word says about your life. You're entitled to eating it. You're entitled to partaking it. It's like golden corral in the spirit. You go in there, you sit down, and you can keep going back to the buffet as many times as you... And let me tell you, the more you go, you won't get more overfilled. You'll just keep getting filled and getting filled and getting filled. See, I'm tired. I am tired of crumbs in my life. I'm tired of the crumbs. I want to start eating the fresh bread from the table, sitting at the table with the king. Instead of crawling under the table, Lord, can I get a little food? You know how dogs are and cats. Dogs will sit there and wait as soon as something hits the ground. Bam, there they are. Bam, there they are. You'll run around the table. Some of you can try to bump the table so something fall off. No, you should be at the table. You see, see, and then we just throw scraps to the dog. And then tell the dogs, you don't need to be a dog no more. Come on into the kingdom. Come on, come on into the kingdom. All these promises are for you too. See, I want you to turn to the book of 2 Samuel right now. Verse 9. You see, there was a man living in a place called Lodabar. By the name of Mephibosheth. A lot of people don't even know the name Mephibosheth. And if they start to read Mephibosheth, they're like, well, I can't pronounce that name. Let's move on to the next chapter. But you'll find 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now, I'm going to give a little bit of a context to the story. You see, here you got King David. He is now king. And for those of you who don't know, David and Saul... Now, how many know that David was anointed king for 20 years and still served under Saul, even while Saul was trying to kill him? Saul was so jealous of David and so vexed with evil spirits that he was trying to kill David. David still served... And he, there's one scripture where David was playing his lyre and singing songs to Saul, trying to soothe the spirit, and Saul started throwing spears at him, and David had to leave. How many got some people like that in your life? <laughs> you, you, you try to soothe them, and they throw spears and daggers at you. Sometimes they just with their eyes, got their dagger eyes at you, amen? Everybody looks at me and says, amen, preacher, we got some of them, right? So here's that, but then the other side of the story was Saul had a son named Jonathan who was an heir to the throne. And David and Jonathan loved each other. They, they, they were the, you know, when we were growing, when I was growing up, there was this thing that some people would do, they would call becoming blood brothers, and you would cut your fingers or cut your wrists, and you would put your hands together and mix blood. And then now that you mixed blood, you were blood brothers. Amen? But Well, that kind of slowed down in the 80s after there were some things going around that were blood-borne infections. But that's what they used to do this thing called blood brothers. Well, David and Jonathan were the first recorded blood brother act. They, they made a covenant with each other. They struck themselves and they made a blood covenant together. And, they, and Jonathan, what Jonathan did was, Jonathan took off everything that represented 
him being an heir to the throne and placed it around David. Now Jonathan and Saul are in battle and they see ultimate defeat coming. So they did what honorable kings in that day did. Rather than having the enemy kill you, they fell on their own swords and they died. So now David is in position of being the king. And he's remembering the covenant that he made with Jonathan. And here we find ourselves in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David and said to the king, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, Is there not anyone of the house of Saul to whom he may show kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, Yes, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. Jonathan's son, grandson, actually a true heir to the throne. So the king said to him, He said, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in a place of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. I'm going to get to that for a second, but turn to to chapter 4 of the same book and read verse 4. And the word of the Lord says, And Jonathan Saul's son, and Jonathan Saul's son had a son, and his name Hold on, I, I, I hit my screen. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So I only shared that to kind of give you the story. So here is Mephibosheth is under the care of the nurse. Word come that Jonathan and Saul are dead. The nurse gets so scared in her haste because she knows, okay, the first two heirs to the throne are dead. The king and the king's son. I'm watching the grandson. They're coming for him. So she's in haste. She's making her ways. However, she dropped Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is five years old. He gets lame in both his feet. Maybe it was a spinal cord injury. I have no idea. But whatever it was, it made him lame in both his feet. Meaning he can't walk. He's got to be carried. Got to be brought from place to place. So now in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we find him in a place called Lodabar. That word Lodabar means pastoralist. No hope. No future. And I believe that a lot of us are living under the table of Lodabar eating crumbs. Saying, this is all I'm ever going to get. This is as far as I'm ever going to get with God. This is all I'm going to ever have. I'm always going to be on assets, on, on food stamps. I'm always going to be living this kind of lifestyle. I'm only going to be just barely saved living like this. And I'm always just barely going to be ex- existing. Well, I'm here today to say, let's come out of Lodabar. Let's say there's no more crumbs. And let's eat at the table of the king continually. Because that's what you're going to find out happens to Mephibosheth. See, Lodabar is a state of mind. Lodabar is, yes, I live here, I exist here, but this is all I'm ever going to be. So you got to get in your mind that there's more for me to come. I have, see, you got to tell yourself, I have a purpose that has been orchestrated and designed by my God. No matter what I think of myself, No matter what anybody else thinks about me, I know what my God thinks about me, and I know where my God is taking me. Hallelujah. I'm coming out of Lodabar. I'm coming out from under the table. I'm tired of just eating crumbs. I want to sit down with my king and feast with him daily. Hallelujah. And everybody can feast with the king daily. You don't have to have a title. People get too hung up on titles. You know, titles can be given, but the real titles are earned. But with Jesus, there are no titles. 
Jesus does not look down on anybody with a title and say, oh, good morning, pastor. How are you? He calls you by your first name. He doesn't care about your title. If you Any title he'd probably give you just be shepherd. Hey, shepherd, how are you today? How is my shepherd over World Harvest Worship Center doing today? How are you? And then be like, how are you taking care of my flock? It's not even about you. It's about him and his flock and his purposes. But we've got to get to the place where we realize that once we get out of our own purposes, that's when we can sit at the king's table. But I'm probably like, like the dog. The dog is just running around chasing little scraps he can get because he's focused on his little old world and his little old tummy. Just like our cat we got on our property. She's always focused on what getting put in that belly. And that's all she does. She'll make friends with anybody she thinks has something in her hand to feed them. Amen? That's how she is. She's a player. She is a player to the max. She's a, she's a, she's a give town player. Amen? She will stroke your heartstrings. Oh, I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. Oh. That's what our, we do as Christians. We run around looking for scraps everywhere. We should be so continually fed by God that we're so full we're giving scraps out to other people. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But look at look at 2 Samuel 9 verse 5. Then King David said and brought him from the house of Akir, the son of Emil from Lodabar, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, here is your servant. Right here, Mephibosheth's state of mind, he's finally found. Thinking in the natural, the king has finally found me. I am the last one to the throne who's going to kill me. That's why he was, he was hiding in Lodabar. He was hiding in a place of no pasture, hoping never to be found, because he was afraid that King David would come out with vengeance, trying to erase the seed of Saul, not knowing that him and Jonathan had a covenant that David was going to follow and honor. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show, surely show you kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan. And, re and here you go. And will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul. And you shall eat at my table regularly. And again he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? See, you've got to get it. We have to get out of the mentality that we're dead dogs in this world. God wants you to eat continually with Him. God wants to continue to give you a feast of the food of His Word and a feast of the food of His Spirit and a feast of the Word of His knowledge and a feast of His presence in your life, a feast of His healing by what His Word says and by what He did on Calvary. See, He doesn't want you looking at yourself as a dead dog. But Fibber's just saying, man, I'm nothing but a dead dog lame on my feet. Why would you even want to do this for me? Well, you don't even have to worry about that because Jesus made a covenant with the Father for your sake. Jesus died so that you could be free and be saved and be free and filled with His Spirit. You see, it's not about you and what you think. You've got to go back and think what God thinks. And God sent His only Son on the cross to die so that the world shall not perish or be condemned and we can be free. So why do we run around like dogs under a table eating the crumbs that we get? We should be like that woman and say, you know what? I'm tired of being treated like a dog. I want what's mine, and I'm going to get what's mine, and I'm coming out from under that table, and I'm putting that devil under my feet. No more crumbs in my life for me. No more crumbs. I'm going to dine with my heavenly Father. And you can do that every day of your life. Even in the middle of oppression, you should be able to run into the lap of Jesus, run into the lap of your heavenly Father, and be like, you know what, Lord? I know this is what it is. The crumbs of your situation and run around like dog is looking at the circumstance and how it looks. You need to get out and look up to the hill from whence your help comes. My help comes from the Lord. My Lord never slumbers and never sleeps. We need to look for His help. And then you can reflect back to the last verse of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
See, when the Lord is your shepherd and you're living through all those promises of Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. That word follow me to seek out as a predator. You can just think of goodness and mercy. I mean, that hunt me down. We proclaim that every day. That <laughs> things are chasing us down. Things are hunting us down. Even if I wanted to, I can't get away from it because it's coming after me. Amen? And that, that's the way you got to think rather than, oh, that devil after me today. Well, he going to catch you if you talk like that. He, right? Oh, that devil coming after me today. And then he's like, yep, thank you. You just gave me access. So you got to take that access away from him. Give access to Jesus. Say, so you know what? Jesus coming after me today. I'm getting me some Jesus today. Amen? My healing's coming today. My healing's coming today. I was listening to this, this book by Smith Wiggles when he told this story about this woman who came with a, uh, a, it was called goiter. I don't even know what it is, but I guess there was a big, a big lumps and stuff on the throat or whatever. And he prayed and told that devil goiter to get out. And the next day she came in and she claimed that she was healed. So the second year she came back, the goiter looked bigger, and she kept saying, testified again. Last year I was at this service and God healed me of my goiter. And everybody looked at like, yeah, okay. And then the third year, and it was even bigger. And God, and, and she said, same thing. And someone actually piped up and said something to her. And then she went home and she said to God, she goes, God, I know you healed me. I know you healed me of that goiter. And then she came back the next day and the goiter was totally gone. You see, she could have stuck around with the crumbs and been like, you know what? Well, I guess I thought you healed me, but I guess you didn't. Instead, while wow, she looked in the mirror every day, because what somebody said to her, she said, um, have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> Your goiter's not gone. It's bigger than it was last year when you said he healed you. You know how skeptical people get. Instead of looking in the mirror, she was looking in the glass of the Word of God that said she was healed, and she was proclaiming it until it came to pass. And then when it came to pass, there were, it was gone. There was other times where people had tumors and, and things, like, and, and they just disappeared. And they were asking questions, because normally when things like that, there's fluids and all this stuff. And no, it's just gone. You see, if you're going to settle for what the devil's put on your plate, well, have at it. Keep running around, sucking up little crumbs like a little dog under the table. But I'm here to say today, I think we should be living as kings, eating from the king's table. Now, not prideful kings, humble servant kings. Remembering that he is the king of kings. And it's only by grace that we're entitled to be sitting at that table. But we don't need to be like dogs running around barely making it every day. Barely having the strength to carry on every day. Amen? Say this. Say, no more crumbs. I'm coming out from under the table. I'm not a dog. I'm a prince or princess. If you're a female princess, if you're a male prince, we don't have any trans princesses around in here. Amen? Nope, nope, nope. It's either prince or princess. No, I'm not sure yet. Amen? But say, no more crumbs. No more crumbs. I'm not a dog. Say, I'm not a dog. Amen. So you got to tell yourself that. The devil wants you thinking you're dogs, that we're all dogs. We're all straight, and, and we're definitely not stray dogs. We all have a home. We all got a home in Jesus Christ. We've all got a purpose in Jesus Christ. We all have a destiny in Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. 